the Executive Director for Sage Community Arts. And I want to welcome you to our artist talk for our latest exhibition, Homecoming, 30 Years of Printmaking Works by Koichi Yamamoto. This show is sponsored by Rachel and Ryan Landis and by Raleigh Ruza State Farm and by the continued support from the Wyoming Arts Council and Alpha Graphics. The reception to follow uh, is catered by our friends at Verdello Fine Foods. A huge thank you to my board of directors and the wonderful staff at SAGE, and to our wonderful neighbors here at the Wyo Theater for hosting us this evening for our artist talk. About a year ago, I started conversations with Koichi uh, to see what it would look like to bring him back for a solo show here in the Sheridan area. And as we exchanged emails, it was evident that he was very excited to get back to this area that he had fallen in love with back in the 80s. And it was a most exciting day when we were finally able to meet in person and install his prints in our gallery that showcases the amazing talents within his uh, printmaking medium. And so without further ado, please help me welcome home our artist, Koichi Yamamoto. This is a very special uh, return to Sheridan County area. And um, I mean, when I started out, when I came here from straight from Japan, 15 years old, and I had no idea. But I met wonderful people, and uh, uh, they really stayed with me, and that helped me to encourage to do something new in life that gave me a uh, confidence. And that's something I learned, and I'd like to share that with you today. So thank you very much. I'm going to put the microphone on. One, two, one, two, can you hear me? Okay, okay. All right. I'm going to put my glasses on. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that um, Jill Benson and Rachel Sage Community Arts Coordinator showed the strong um, leadership and the people who made this happen, and Sonia Raleigh. Mr. Hills, thank you very, very much for the connecting the dots to bring me back here and uh, providing the space and opportunity to communicate and share ideas together. So thank you very much. Um, today I'd like to talk about um, my life work through the perspective of the static and dynamic. In this context, the static uh, as a still or minimum motion and dynamic as a changeable, active, and then adaptable. Animism as an idea that natural object and the universe itself has a soul. Supernatural power sounds like out of my reach, but natural power seems to be obtainable with a correct approach. People have been flown kites for millennia for relaxation as a recreation military signaling, and scientific experimentations. Practice originated in China around 3,000 years ago, later spread to Southeast Asia and beyond. 18th century Japan, kites were used for festivals, spectacle, entertainment, competition, celebration, and it brought people together and experienced their natural force. So thus, the kite becomes a symbol of unity and hope. Documentation of daily activities, repetition of the geometry, echo from the mountain top, the roof peak over the mountain, and the kites go beyond the reach. In the 20th century, there are other applications such as the surveillance aerial photograph for military use. These studies gave birth to aerodynamics, and later the first flight takes place in North Carolina outer banks. I wanted to bring my art outside of the gallery museum setting, and flying kites helped me to visualize natural energy. Also, it is a good reason to go outside and then revisiting the sense of the unity and hope. The vehicle I used uh, for this task, uh, I made a hexagon kite called a Sanjo Rokkaku kite. 
this design uh, unchanged for 2,000 years, and the ratio of five to four hexagon structurally, aerodynamically made sense. The device gave me an opportunity to experience and understand the power of the wind, lift, drag, oops, okay. How's it going? Man? One moment, there's a technical bridge. So making the kite um, kind of gave me an opportunity to uh, take the artwork outside a, a galley setting. And then and it's a really, really wonderful opportunity, the kind of excuse for me to go outside. And then, and it's a, uh, you know, artwork is a kind of a very, uh, subjective things like what is good art and what is bad art but the, if there's a technology there's a science of a, the kite if it flies well and that's a good kite it doesn't fly it's obviously not so good kite so there's a way to kind of challenging things out there here <laughs> well thank you I managed it right <laughs> so the um, I, so this is sort of diagram the physics of the kite lift drag tension and weight I mean, I kind of consider these are the sort of uh, the metaphor of the life, and then uh, finding the sufficient balance is extremely important. And sometimes there's no wind; I can't really do anything about it. Just accept the reality, and um, the gravity is over my head. And uh, only option is just the waiting. But look like it's thinking something, so it's sort of something happening there. Adjusting bridal loop lengths, and then find the correct balance and attention. And fine tuning and is essential for different type of the wind. If it fails to do so, it will not fly or it could break against the force of the wind. And flying them in various locations and conditions, document its behavior and study, the, study for the improvement. At the end, this activity makes me healthy and Created. So uh, this is one example uh, of the kite display indoor, and trying to make it an interactive piece so that uh, people can come over and then pull the bar, connect with the line. You can lift the kites like this, and that change that by uh, pulling that um, uh, different lines makes the angle of the attack look different. So uh, connecting with the other artists is always uh, stimulating. And here's an artist who work with a CNC router. Um, instead of a drill, they use a, a color marker and then uh, uh, draw onto the Tyvek plastic material that I turn into the kite. So uh, I propose a project. Uh, there's an uh, organization called the Southern Graphic Council International. In 2020, uh, to, uh, I collect about 37 artists made a kite together um, but it was postponed to 2023 and it will take place in, in uh, Puerto Rico. So here they are. I would like to introduce those kites I made with the uh, artists from all over. Um, uh, Simon Philip is from uh, Cyprus and uh, Anna Nicholson's from Puerto Rico. And Tatiana Pot from Slovakia. And Sami Yu is from uh, uh, South Korea. Uh, Maria Pina Bentivenga is from Italy, and Justin Diggles from the UK, and Heather Muse and Matt Egan are from uh, 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 Greenville, South, North, North Carolina, and Carla Hartmiller is from Ohio, Tim Musso is from California, uh, Miguel Argan from Texas, and Gianna Bentivenga from Rome, Italy. Um, Umberto Sanes from Texas and Nick Roos from New York. And Jenny Schmidt is from Minnesota, Minneapolis, and Stephanie Dykes from Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, Mi Jin Shin is from Buffalo, New York. Umberto Giovannini is from Rimini, Italy. And Raul Catianku is from Romania. And Bill Fick is from uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, Chiho Ushio is from Hawaii. And Anya Kenner is from Poland. And Bobby Lyons, my colleague, uh, resides in Knoxville, Tennessee. And Dusty Havers from uh, uh, Syracuse, New York. 
and Jen Shore in, in Indiana, and Jim Lee is in Kansas. And Joseph Balacres is from uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, and John Bobo from Hawaii. And Taro Takizawa is from Copenhagen, Denmark, and John Swindler from Georgia. Uh, Emmett Merrills from uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and Pietro De Ciro from Florence, Italy. And Bo Fleming and Jeff Sherbin is from Buffalo, New York, and Gene Grumper from uh, Colorado City. And John Hancock is from uh, Texas, and Eric Watercutty is from Charlotte, North Carolina. I remember all that. <laughs> <laughs> and these kites are made from uh, many small parts, but they're exchangeable and uh, replaceable because uh, maintenance is a part of this uh, uh, flying kite. They do break. Anticipating the preparation uh, prepare for malfunction and expected the gusty conditions and then be ready to replace the damaged parts. The main reason I chose this uh, uh, Roka kite design is its ability to roll and then pack and then travel uh, relatively easy. They're lightweight material. It takes a lot of space, but they're, they're not heavy, so it's easy to travel and ship it in a different location assemble it and, uh, and then fly to the, the, whatever location that is. So the carbon fiber rods, uh, they're not invincible, they do break. Uh, so when the kite crashes and so the lines get cut, so I had to be prepared for those kind of events. So it's not just the making kites, but a lot of the maintenance and then that's sort of part of this uh, arc of the kite flying and kite making. And then once it flies, they're officially uh, baptized as a kite by definition, but that each kite is unique, they behave slightly different, and then um, uh, those affect the performance of the flying, and then they kind of like it has a sort of personality once it flies, and uh, it's, a, it's different, those images, sometimes those printed uh, material, like ink is heavy, and then they don't fly that well, but they're, well, some images are not really balanced. And this particular material, uh, the kite, uh, is made by um, 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 the Samiyo, this one is uh, uh, made, uh, made on a ripstop nylon printed and it's super lightweight. And this one actually I flew in a big home mountain in 2020. So the, uh, in the beginning, it was like a paper airplane kite designing. I created this mock um, sort of wind tunnel and then print studio and then studying those behaviors. And later on, I started uh, using a sewing machine, uh, uh, sewing up together to make these kites. And then they're quite a lot of fun to make it. This is a design developed by NASA in the 1960s. And then after I was making those kites, and then they were just a wonderful subject for drawing as well. So. So frigate bird, uh, soaring the sky without flapping the wing, travel up to 300 miles per day, and then clear adaptation and evolution, perfect design for kite. So I learned that, uh, so the mimic those designs, making those kites like this, and then stay till late night in the studio, thinking about this thing gonna fly, or maybe not. Or sometimes I get just over-designed and then, and then just just realizing, like, oh my god, I'm putting all the kind of stuff that absolutely unnecessary. So learning from those failures is very important. And lift, drag, tension, wind. These are non-structural kite. And collective uh, the wind socks put together to make that wing shape to create the lift. And then what we call it's a low aspect ratio kite. They they fly kind of like a really crazy. They sort of reminds me a bit of a, like a shrimp uh, flying in the air. So it's a pretty interesting kind of character comes out of it. Very unstable kite. In 2015, we did this collaboration uh, work with a, uh, the artist named Cannonball Press from the Brooklyn, New York. They printed this 12 zodiac images into the uh, ripstop nylon. And then I cut them to hexagon and pentagon shape to create, uh, so like a soccer ball patterns, I guess. And then um, we get this uh, wind uh, a generator, like you often you see at the car dealers and such, you know, connected together, put the winds up there, and then uh, create a little sphere. So that was a theme for uh, the conference in 2015. So that's what it looks like from the inside. They're very translucent material. Um, folding a paper, making those kite shapes, not like an air, paper airplane. 
uh, their printed material and then uh, was kind of playing with those a geometry shape with the organic lines. Calculated geometry and cal calligraphy coexist in the same space. The contrast intensified aesthetic tension. Material speaks its soul in this quiet moment with constant light and action. How to utilize the soul of the material, maintain its integrity with a care, and having a protection of the oscillation from natural material and static that contains a dynamic quality. And these elements I'm seeking and collecting and then put them into the image, making a kite together. And also exploring the design from the insect wing, biomimicry, tension with the bamboo and the string, and those are some high aspect ratio kites. And these are designed are coming from butterflies or cicadas uh, wings. So here's some uh, example of display kite indoor at the gallery space. And this was a gallery in Austin, Texas. And it's an interesting contrast between this very cold, uh, hard concrete walls and floor versus the very soft material and light material. And then we had a little bit of wind uh, in the gallery, so the kite will move around. And when you see these kids rolling around like this, like it, that made my day. <laughs> so this is uh, my studio in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I made a visit to Sanjo, Japan. Uh, the birthplace was a rock a hexagon kite. There's a kite maker, 16th generation family business, uh, still on making, keeping a tradition of unity and hope. The 350 years tradition of Sanjo kite festivals continues. As long as this festival uh, keeps reoccurring, and the kite maker will cut the bamboo and dry them and stretch paper and paint, anticipation of flight. And this is a labor of the optimist, connecting the people, all looking up for something exciting. Autonomous device, dancing in the sky, and they began to have a dialogues. I've been making kite for about seven years now, but I learned a lot. It helps me to see what and how to eliminate unnecessary things. It makes me creative in this natural world, and most importantly, it keeps me healthy. That's 50 years ago, me. <laughs> and later on, I went to uh, high school, uh, junior high in Osaka, Japan. Although I worked for the Tennessee Volunteers, but once I was Tom River Eagles, and I'll be always have the identity in my heart. And defeat is uneasy to accept, but it is, gives us opportunity to learn and grow. The failure is always a fertilizer for success, I believe. And having the generous support from the best coach I had in the state of Wyoming, we accomplished many memorable moments that stayed in mind that experience will never go away, that no one, nobody can take away from me. These memories we treasure and they remind us to live today fully. Life is made of such insignificant everyday moments. My interest in art began from the earthwork. Low-fire ceramic object made to look like a natural well-bone, eliminating any record of human hands, buried underground in various locations through the Oregon coast then dig out, excavate them later on. Even today, there are uh, many uh, pieces buried underneath and uh, uh, waiting to be decomposed. This type of the activity that I was doing was uh, undergraduate students and when I was 24 in the Pacific Northwest College of Art in Portland, Oregon. It was my uh, perception of a memento mori, the idea of ephemerality, the all universal structure and object are programmed to decompose. Regardless of race, gender, faith, wealth, all the spectrum of the political beliefs, something we all have in common. So that's where I learned to print the lithography, the printing from the limestone, and, and, and that craft that I fell in love with it. Um, at this time, I was not aware of what I was making, but I was just, whatever I had an interest in, I would just jump in and start making it. And um, grinding the stone is a physical aspect of the printmaking, was something I really enjoyed doing that. 
So idea of the static dynamic, now I can talk about it. Back then I had no idea, but I was composing uh, things that um, um, has a sort of sense of the energy. I'm collaging lithography prints onto the uh, uh, monotype. Vanitas is the idea, the 17th century Dutch still life paintings was something I kept looking at it at the Portland Art Museum. The vanity displayed with the symbol of um, inevitability of the death and closed energy in a composed, composed reality. The search for lithography stone, I moved to Krakow, Poland in 1992, three years after that Iron Curtain was dissolved. The end of the Soviet era, Cold War was over, so we had a lot of optimism at the time. Making lithography prints in Krakow, Poland in the early 90s, it was a very educational experience for me. Subbing myself into the Polish Artists' Union and making a print, sharing the process together with the artist, escaped from Yugoslavia, the country dissolved and uh, divided and dissolved. Witnessed and understood that consequence of the Soviet communism, my ambition of ignorance and, uh, was beaten down. This passage I took was not practical or easy. Looking back now, it was, it was a walking on a thin ice. But because of that, it made all the difference in my life. Six similar stones were in action. I'm grinding a stone in the morning, etch and roll up, and print that in the afternoon. And they give the second edge and roll up in the evening, draw the next stone with a frozen co uh, cosmetic eyeliner. Uh, system become habitual, like a Newton's law. And the, uh, once the flywheel turns, it will keep the momentum and maintain that velocity. Every day for nine months, eliminating an unnecessary action, single run, addition five each. After that, come back to Portland, USA, exit, ex exhibit my work. This is a studio called Zbionzek Porstik Artistic Plastic, which is an artist union studio. There are very two camps. There's an academy and then there's a union member. And so I worked with the, uh, the artist and academy. This is a sort of uh, artist-run union member studio um, that, that they helped a lot of the artists, refugees from Bosnia, Croatia, Macedonia, and Romania. So I got to work with these guys. And then they told us, when back then there was no whole lot of internet information, so I really didn't know what was going on, but listening to what was going on in Yugoslavia was a quite an eye-opening um, um, experience. So this uh, lifestyle was uh, uh, outsourcing myself to a country like Poland and making the artwork reduce the cost of production, and then and every summer I'll come back to Portland, Oregon and exhibit the work to generate the fund. So I did that uh, for about five years, back and forth between Eastern Europe and then uh, Oregon and Seattle area. So I did that for five years. And I don't think I can do that anymore, but it's a, um, it was a very challenging time, but I was very fulfilling as an artist. So later on, I got to work with an artist named uh, Dusan Kala. He's an engraver, illustrator from Slovakia. And then I entered the, uh, finally I entered the academy. Uh, copper engraving is this a 15th century technique and sort of lost craft in a way. Not many people does that anymore. But the, uh, it was a perfect place to learn in the Slovakia Republic in Bratislava. After that, I moved to uh, Poznan, Poland to make more lithography. But the studio wasn't really equipped to do that. They didn't have really good ink, they didn't have good paper materials. So I started doing this thing called monotype. Monotype is like a, just a drawing. Basically, I painted it on a, on a plexiglass and then uh, draw with uh, uh, rags, Q-tips, you know, um, any plastic cards and so on, and then pr uh, print on the paper, just one uh, print. So I will work on the, on the plexiglass all day, and then if I like it, I'll print it. If I don't, I'll just clean up the plates and just go home. Yeah. And finally, I received a scholarship to study at the University of Alberta in, in, in Canada, in Edmonton. So that was a time I can really work a larger piece and um, that winter is so long over there and they told me there's a two seasons in Edmonton. One's called winter, another one's called July. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the study from the artist named Elizabeth Ingram and Walter Jewell at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. And these are the artists really, really taught me how to adapt 
and then also um, challenged to make the artwork a little more larger size, which before I was like, engravings are usually modest, they're pretty small, but um, to work on that scale really helped me to, um, oh, you know, to, so new challenge for making the graphic work in this scale, the creative adaptation. And then later, I got a job at the um, uh, Utah State University in Logan, Utah. That was the first real job. And then, um, so suddenly living in the central northern Utah, I kind of came back this memory. I grew up in this area in Sheridan, going up the mountain, skiing at the Animal Butte. And, I mean, these are the things that stayed with me. So when I came to Utah, I explored the area a lot, in central Utah, southern Utah. Drawing a copper plate, uh, what we call the smoke ground, and I apply this waxy medium on the copper plate, I put it in the backpack, and then go to the location. I just draw from that, and then come back to campsite. And I had a Tupperware with a ferric chloride acid, and I would etch it at the campsite. And so, working in this real environment, you know, gives a real challenge, like the temperatures and and uh, or sudden change of the weather, or sometimes flash flood and stuff like that. But uh, in a way, uh, that really, really uh, uh, gave me a focus that, okay, I have to finish up this work and within the next two hours, and then there's a little rush, but the, that gave me a uh, focus, like intense focus to work on the smoke plates for the given time. So not only the drawing the like, ge uh, geological structure, but also the atmosphere, the rains and snows and stuff like that. Visible things, invisible things underneath the ground, and try to capture the sense of the monumentality that I really, really seek for it. And then um, in 2005, I made a, a series of monotype. They were under, I kind of tell myself, under 25 minutes each. This was sort of uh, started out as a, as a ritual of a cleaning the roller end of the day. And then end of the day, printing, I'm tired, I just want to go home. And, but I still have to clean those walls, rollers. They're quite expensive uh, equipment. But the cleaning, well, of course, that's the kind of job that I have to do it, but I want to make this as more productive. So I started um, cleaning, uh, cleaning roller on the plexiglass and started printing it, and then started creating these kind of images. So the idea was sort of making a sort of product out of a byproduct in a way, and then start learning to control the roller and making these kind of landscape. And then uh, while I was in the southern Utah, I did a lot of hiking and then nighttime because during the daytime it's so hot. So under the moonlight, uh, it's incredible how much you can see. And I spent the time um, uh, hiking in the night and I had a, a black uh, sketchbook draw with a white pencil to draw the light. And then so these are the kind of uh, the landscape work I was doing now. Later on, I got a, a new appointment at the University of Delaware in New York. And that's where the, I start associating with a more like a fluid, um, liquid elements into the, my landscape work. And same thing, these are the very quick um, monotypes. They're about six foot tall, they're very large, but uh, it's very physically active. And then, so some of the mark I used to, uh, do you remember the, the croc sandals, right? <laughs> and then I will uh, take the croc sandal to wooden shop and then get rid of the texture. So I have a plexiglass on the floor wearing a croc sandal and using a feet to draw. So that's the, my foot drawings. Um, yeah, those are fun to do. Yeah. Very, very spontaneous. And, uh, so this, uh, I was working with this uh, really vertical format, and then one, one reason I did was that uh, there was an opportunity to design a snowboard. And I had friends uh, who were in Jackson Hall, and, uh, and they were uh, sort of collecting the information, uh, design and opportunity for snowboard. It didn't really uh, finalize it, but uh, it was uh, really fun to make it, uh, this kind of design, that format. So. Transparency and then sort of the kind of dark area. There's nothing in there, but it's not an empty space. There's some substance there, but you can't really see what exactly that is. Atmospheric perspective and direction of the light. In a way, I was kind of still sort of searching for this monumentality. That was first time I came to Wyoming, see 
uh, like a structure like Devil's Towers and so on, these really, really stayed with me. And even today, I just uh, kind of uh, uh, try to capture that, that power of this earth in a way. And one thing about printmaking uh, it has a really ability to make a multiples, but also combine different kind of um, uh, uh, combination of different parts of uh, images together. Like a words, there's a prefix and suffix and so on, and then uh, creating those juxtaposing two different uh, images and st start creating a new vocabulary into the visual art. Selection and the combinations, and splitting a, a paper in half, collaging together. And then I start folding paper. What happens is like when you print intaglio print, the ink is still wet. So I fold the paper and goes to the press and you open that and the perfect symmetry comes out of it. So I was playing with that idea at the time. And so this is some an example of display of monotype. You can kind of tell the scale of that. And uh, in fact, this prints on the display here, I brought that here. And monotype has a very, very dynamic, spontaneous, very quick uh, artwork versus the middle part of this belt area of intaglio printing is extremely slow. So um, I'm kind of playing with the idea of the, the first spontaneous mark making versus a very, very carefully uh, planted out mark making together in the coexisting same space. And these were the uh, commission work I was uh, making for the island, uh, big islands in Hawaii, in the University of Hawaii in Hilo. So symmetry is a kind of fun, uh, strange thing, so what we uh, sort of recognize or what we want to recognize, we want to make sense of nonsense. And then we see things that, uh, that we want to see because the, the kind of human mind is a uh, fascinating things. If we don't know exactly where we're looking at it, we feel really insecure. But when we label it, and then we're going to come to some kind of sort of piece or conclusion to our mind. Investing the layer of the time, I occasionally make this kind of ceramic work, and then using a different color of the clay, fold it together, go through the press, and then and making all the strata and then uh, sort of making little miniature parts and then after do the low fire and paint with a watercolor it was a very fun project to do those kind of things so my true love of the printmaking is copper engraving um, it's this uh, because of that it's a low tech of, uh, capability i can do this anytime anywhere with the minimum tool requires and i don't really have to have a really heavy equipment so I'm very inspired by 16th century Northern Renaissance uh, graphic work such as this. And then when you look at it and in the detail, you can kind of feel this artist motion and then and almost kind of feel this uh, breathing of the artist in a way. And I remember when I was learning and engraving in the Bratislava, my teacher was telling me that, Koichi, do you know how to ice skate? Like, no, I do not. Like, well, you gotta learn how to ice skate before you do the engraving. And then I kind of understood what he was talking about. And then uh, in 2002, when I was in Utah, I get to see this uh, Russian uh, uh, ice skater practice at the Utah State University ice rink. And the mark they're making on the ice was absolutely gorgeous. So making an illusion of the three-dimensionality out of a little tiny, tiny mark of the insignificant uh, lines together and then creating this collective idea of the three-dimensional form. I mean, these are the illusions. But this is the kind of method they used it from the 16th century, and even today, uh, like the uh, uh, printing technology of the halftones and so on are still carrying on the same concept. So some are the prints like this, and when I see this a facial expression, that's really hard to forget. And so that's what I was playing with. It. What is how we read a face, and then folding a paper and creating those uh, three dimensionality. So uh, play and a seek without um, confirmation bias, and not in the research particular result, but experimentations come from the failure as well. But if there's 2% of success, it's worth doing that. So uh, I got myself this, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the kinetic sand. This is a toy, I guess, a mixture of silicone with a, uh, sand. Often you see that in a dentist's office and children will play with that. 
So I put it on the, on the mirror and then we'll start playing with it, um, creating those three dimensional forms. And then since I was working the symmetry idea, I didn't have to work with the entire plates. I only worked for this half of that and then making those kind of prints. Do you see the cat sleeping there? <laughs> And I had the opportunity to work with this uh, artist, her name is Sally French. She lives on Kauai Islands in Hawaii. And then uh, she has this large collection of this toy. And this is one of this uh, King of Wild Frontier baby figure. And then so I had to use those things because I live in Tennessee. And then uh, some of the images like this combined together. And then you, know, you, you see the synthesize of the two images together. When we look at it, we're going to make sense out of nonsense. Well, some like it, some audio response image like this, and then um, some like my sort of childhood memory from writing a drawing and printing together become like this. So uh, co uh, collecting those uh, two parts together, making that creating a new uh, vocabulary, visual vocabulary like that. So, but combination of selection was my method, and then um, putting those two things together. If visually works, and then we somehow we synthesize in our head. So I was playing with those kind of games of how we see things or how we analyze things and how we want to understand what it is. So I'm going to go through this very quickly and then... And some of the source image is coming from uh, South America, figurines or toys or um, ceramic tile from Japan. And then a uh, small doll from, uh, from the Southeast Asia, from Thailand. And by combining, printing it, uh, two images on top of each other, so you're forced to see two images simultaneously. And evolving an image one to another. These are from the plastic toy, I think. There's a Japanese word, kimo kawaii. Kimo means creepy, and kawaii is cute, creepy cute. So it's something we're attracted to it, but at the same time we're repulsed against that. So I, I thought it was quite an interesting idea of that. Sometimes I think about the human curiosity come from this warning sign in a way, something dangerous, but we cannot help not to look at it. And these are work I did with the students with the Syracuse University and their wonderful team there. Evolve one image to another. It's like, uh, so they kind of relate to each other, so it has a similar DNA, they're similar but they're different, each unique impressions. It's almost there. <laughs> so this time I was interested in our, our uh, naval architectures, like how a boat was made and then sort of lead to the idea of the kite later on. but. Uh, um, how there's a structural engineering that was really, really fascinating things to me. And then and then also the, a lot of printmakers, uh, particularly in the 18th century, Italy, uh, people like uh, 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 Piranesi and these artists work uh, as a printmaking, as a medium for the architecture design. So, so I was uh, 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 wants to kind of revisit that sort of tradition of the printmaking. These are one of the kinds, and then I just make a lot of stuff. And then, you know, as far as I have a quantity goes, and then my printmaking teacher was telling me that once the, uh, even though it's baseball players, you know, they will have a 30%, you're doing very well. So I allow myself to have a 70% of the, this uh, failure, and then I have a 30% of success, and that's, a, I'm doing very well. So. So this was a, a print I was making in 2006, and then you see this hexagon shapes right here. That was in Logan, Utah in 2005, and then 2019, there you go. I'm back to this hexagon shape again. It's really funny how this creative little circle in there. So, 
So 2019, before the pandemic, I had an opportunity to work with artists in, uh, in Rome. Later on, I gave a printmaking workshop in a place called um, Montefiore de Conca, which is near Rimini. And there's a castle, they have a print shop there. It's a pretty remarkable place. So I get to meet with artists, not from all of Italy, but there are some from, uh, from Austria, some from Germany. They came to uh, take a workshop with me. And uh, in this process, I get to meet with this uh, wonderful young artists who are fascinated, interested in this uh, very, very old technology, which is originating in Italy. That, so I kind of felt really uh, foreign from coming from outside. But uh, what I learned in the Eastern Europe that so revisiting bring that back to the Italy and then in the process I got to meet with the wonderful people. The title of the exhibit is called the, the Static Dynamic. Everything is constantly in motion, everything is constantly moving. My prior interest to the printmaking was a lot to do with the geology. It's a human perspective, it doesn't seem like it's moving a lot, but the mountain is moving, tectonic plate is moving, we're constantly moving and transmitting the information and the feeling together and the celebrate our being in this planet. sorta di struttura narrativa, trittici e ellittici che vengono visti in, in sequenza su uno sfondo con delle immagini al centro, quindi sviluppando quasi un carattere letterario narrativo della mostra. Il ragionare con pochi elementi ma fuori dagli schemi, cioè parlare di due immagini che si compongono mille volte sempre diverse. È stato anche interessante vedere come lui eh, cercava di indurre i ragazzi a essere se stessi, a capire la cosa da cui sono attratti. di poter incontrare un artista affermato, ho potuto vedere come si relazionava al suo lavoro, le sue tecniche, uh, ho potuto scoprire tantissime cose nuove che non penso nemmeno mi sarebbero venute in mente. Wonderful to be here and uh, because of my interest to the interior of printmaking which is originated from Italy. So it is my honor to share with a traditional value for me Working with the students helped me to realize how important to communicate in this level with technology, and especially the international level. So that's something I could keep at home. So that was a 2019 December. We didn't know what COVID uh, was at the time. And then after that, March 2020, I was in Big Home, Wyoming, flying kite. But that time that uh, this, uh, I got kicked out from the lodge because they had to close it. So I had to uh, change my flight, fly back to Knoxville, Tennessee right after that. And back in Knoxville, I bought a small press and turned my living room into the print studio and making these kind of impressions. I mean, there's a bit of a limitation because uh, I have a, such a small press. Um, university had a big machine there, but I couldn't, ha I didn't have really access to it. So I started combining those small parts together to make a larger compositions. Kind of, you know, I was kind of thinking about like it was a shish kebab of the bunch of little parts together and make, start making prints or, or stupa maybe, I was, uh, had some idea of that. But the challenging to uh, operate under the uh, given condition. And um, of course, I started teaching a class through the online. That was very challenging as well. But, so that's my living room looks like it. And then start breaking with little small prints and then different kind of material and then combine together. And then there's some snowboard design. Yeah. So this is what I'm pa passionate about doing these days and kart surfing. And this is a sort of uh, activity that keep me uh, very creative and then and also understand the natural world. So uh, this is a, a few days ago. I was at the a Big Four Mountain and that's where I was doing the, the snow kiting, which is attached to the kite with a snowboard on it. And this is uh, nearby the Bold Mountain, which is very close from, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the Medicine Hill. This is one of the best places in the world to do this. And it's incredible. I met people from Europe, from uh, 
um, from U.S. all over. Uh, there's a group of, of the the kites are uh, snow kite are come from the Red City uh, in South Dakota. There's a, a, a two team, one from the France, one from Belgium, and then there's a group of people from New York City, and then there's another people from Oregon too, actually. Um, so it's like incredible this. Uh, that I, when I heard about the snow kiting and they said a big home, you gotta go to big home. Like, wow, that's somewhere I grew up with. It. So, <laughs> so in a way, kind of created a little complete circle and then revisiting and then and then um, get to do the one I'm you know interested to do. And then this is a place that is a, I mean, I would say it's so hard to find those kind of places because there's a wind and the snow qualities and then also. If there's a steep mountain, the, uh, there's a danger for the avalanches, so that finding that very, very safe environment to do this kind of activity is uh, very rare. So I just want you to know uh, this is one of the best places to do snow kiting up in the Big Horn Mountain. So I'm trying to expand what I'm doing, what I'm born to do, and learning and exposed to new experience, and also the accepting the failure as well. I got to choose and then define the meaning of life and really generally and then each of us what we do now informs what's going to happen to the future and then what we're doing right now become a past i like to focus on what is in right front of me like a drawing carving cutting etching rolling printing stretching paper all this physical labor the things i have to do in right front of it but meaning of the idea sometimes the the artists tend to kind of focus on, on, the, on the idea, but the, the idea, to me, idea comes a little later. The, the work comes first, I think. And then, so, so by taking action, I get some kind of result. It's not always a result I'm looking for it, but the, I discover something. And then I think that learn to accept that. So, which is kind of similar to scientific exploration as well. So. I would like to end with a quote by Lucio Seneca, who's says 2,000 years old. Roman philosopher. Life is very short and anxious for those who forget the past, neglect the present, and fear the future. It is not what we have a short time to live, but what we waste a lot of it. Life is long enough, and sufficiently generous amount has given us for the highest achievement if it were all well invested. But when it is wasted and heartless, heedless, luxury, and spent on no good activity, we are forced to last by death's final constraint to realize, but it has been passed away before we knew it was passing. Life is long if you know how to use it. Thank you very much.